I like went to get a drink and I came back uh, like tucked like uh, Silence of the Lambs <laughs> like like that and, like right, no pants sure. or anything. Welcome to Nine Cents, take two. Right. Nine Cents is a satanic perspective of our modern world. I'm your host, Adam Campbell, being joined by Aaron. Hello. And we are super excited to have been recording this time. This time. Yeah, we didn't get far in this time. We've actually recorded an entire show without recording it, so... Talk okay. about a waking nightmare. <laughs> I think we're good now. I'm, I'm looking at my... My audio recording levels, and they all look good. Okay, well, it is September 21st, and we have a fantabulous, fantabuloso episode for you this week. Uh, in The Devil's Advocate, we're going to start off with the fourth satanic statement. Now, I don't remember if... I don't remember. I don't know if you remember, Aaron. <laughs> but when I first started going over these um, satanic statements, you had asked me to hold out on this one for you, right? Oh. Oh, that sounds vaguely familiar. And you know, it's funny because my first the thing first thing I was going to talk about was how, oh my God, this is my favorite one, and it's so <laughs> weird that you would pick this. So there you go, folks. That's what we call in the industry a tease <laughs> for the listeners. Ta-da. Oh yeah. Um, all right, so it's uh, it's going to be a good one. We're going to talk a little bit about the four satanic statement, and uh, you know, maybe extrapolate on some related thoughts. And in the middle of the show, Agent Provocateur, Darren DSI, delivers episode 16. I hope. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I always put these together out of sync, so I never quite know, but he's never failed me yet, so let's let's hope uh, it's going to be a kick-ass one. I have and then of course, in him. I do too. Absolutely. And of course, uh, at the tail end of the show, we have you, Aaron. That's me, Aaron. That is, yeah. You're Aaron. That's me. And you're going to be delivering episode 27, right? If you say so, that sounds I, fucking absurd. If you ask me, though, <laughs> it's it's been so long that you've been doing this. Um, episode twenty-seven. So what what's the title for this? What's the theme? Uh, the theme and the title is colors because I am really fresh out of creative ideas and I couldn't come up with a <laughs> clever name for this. So the theme and the name are just colors because I couldn't think of something funny to call it. That sounds. Uh, but I mean, it it could be racist. Well, oh God, I didn't even think about that. Thanks, Adam. No, I, what I, I like to bring that out in people. Uh, clearly, you do. <laughs> um, but uh, we could say it like, um, like the Ice Tea movie. Was it Ice Tea? You know that colors. So let's Col- call it that colors, colors, colors. Very nice. That's how I rap, everyone. So <laughs> look for my stuff on a uh, band tune. What is that? <laughs> What's it called? <laughs> I, I don't know. Bandcamp. Wherever good music is sold, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> right. Sorry. I have already ruined this episode. I... Colas, colas. Yo, <laughs> yo. Yeah. No, I think we can freestyle something here. Hold on. Oh, hold on. Please um, don't. <laughs> Beg of you. I've got a color in mind. I don't know what it's going to be. <laughs> I don't know. I gotta, That's all I got. I think I got to go, actually. What? Sorry. No. But, I think my I hear my mom calling me. I promise I will not. Yeah, that's. that's <laughs> I don't believe you anymore. I thought you were telling me the truth up until that point. All right. Um, all right. So before we start, call for questions here, people. The Greater Magic episode is coming up rapidly, rapido, 
And uh, yeah, if you want to be included, I've already gotten a number of questions, so uh, send in yours, and I will try to squeeze them into this really fantastic show I have planned with these two other amazing individuals. So you will definitely want them to address your questions because of who they are, and uh, yeah, I'll probably just listen the whole time because <laughs> I dig these two uh, much more than listening to myself. You are so. you are such a tease. Oh, dude, you don't even know. You're going to tell it's, me after this, right? You're going to tell me after this. Yeah, I'm going to tell you. I'm not going to tell anyone else except for you. Yeah. And every other segment producer who asks. Oh. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> I thought you just meant me. Your favorite. That's oh, I'm, well, okay. So, yes, you're my favorite. Of course. Um, I tapped Jesse first. Uh, I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean it to come out this way, her? but I. <laughs> I love Jesse. I gladly share you with Jesse. Nice. Well, I'm going to be excited to share this information with you because it's good stuff. It's good stuff. I'm going to tell right, so everybody. Don't worry, guys. <laughs> I'm not telling you anything. Oops. I'm not Oops. telling you anything ever again. You weren't supposed to hear that part. Ever since my banana hammock comment. Ugh. Stop it. <laughs> A bunch of inside jokes. I know the audience loves that. All right, so uh, The Secret Life of a Satanist, re-release by Blanche Barton, has been released. <laughs> Again. Fuck? Hence the name. <laughs> For the second time. Uh, no, there, there's some added content to this. So, uh, Aaron, have you have you read the first one? Of course. Did you enjoy it? Of course. Yeah, I love this <laughs> I'm stuff. waiting for it. No. Fucking no, that was books. stupid. I hated books it. Books are lame. Actually, I never even read it, but I hate it anyway. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, it Just was uh, not the internet. Uh, <laughs> so it, it was uh, released again with some extra content. So the the first issue of the Secret Life of a Satanist came up until the point of um, oh, I would say early '90s. I would think mm -hmm. you know, sort of the the, the recovery after the Satanic Panic of the Church of Satan and uh, its members and. It, um, really focusing on uh, the success that Anton LaVey had put into this organization. Uh, however, there was some significant information or, or, or history that's happened since then, of course. Our founders passed, um, and there was a number of issues, rumors, uh, internet squabblings that had occurred from that moment until, uh, I'm sure, in some dark corners of the web today. Mm -hmm. um, this addresses all of it. And brilliantly, I might add. So I, I picked this up, um, and if you haven't picked it up, Aaron, I can, I can share it with you. It's definitely a good read, and it is, it's a lot more than uh, just a handful of pages. Um, there's actually extra images. If you, I don't think it's, it's well, it's, it's, it's available as a Kindle version, and it's available as the traditional paperback. So um, I, for people who don't know, so the first edition was put out in like the early 90s, right? By Feral House. Yeah. And then there was a, so, and then there was a paperback a couple years later, right? And then, so who, who, who is Feral House putting out this newest release or who's putting that out? It, it is Feral House still. Oh, they're okay. So great. That's, I'm happy to hear that. And I thought that was the case, but I decided. It's actually a really good feeling book too. I mean, it's, it, there, there's nothing remarkable in the makeup of it. It's just, it, it feels really nice on the hand a little bit better than the original one. I think, um, it's probably just because paper being produced is, is grown so much, uh, in quality since even just a decade ago, let alone two. Um, but there are extra images in here that, that were not in the original. And Ooh. if you are a fan of, you know, obviously historical photos of the Church of Satan and of Anton LaVey, then for that reason alone, it's definitely worth getting the paperback edition as I'm flipping through it. Uh, there are, you know, those images that are just, uh, have been in the original one, which were just fantastic. It really adds color to, ironically, they're in black and white, but it adds color to um, the content within the book. Um, the, the revised content, however, it is much more... Um, it is so goddamn personal, the way that it's it's laid out. It's, I mean, it, it, I really genuinely felt like, like I was sitting down, having a cocktail, and uh, Magister Barton was just explaining <laughs> her history with Anton Lavey to me. I mean, it, it was it was really great. And so if if you caught my one on one um, with Magister Barton, then you got some of this. Oh my uh, god, that was such a good interview. 
<laughs> oh, she was, she's amazing. It was she's it was so a lot great. of fun. Such an inspiration. But she goes in, yeah, she goes into so much more detail with this, and uh, I mean, so much more. It it almost seems like it's too much to be quite Ooh. honest. Like I don't think that people deserve. I don't think I deserve <laughs> to know some of the information that was put out, and 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 so I'm I'm sitting here thinking, you know. Why would why would someone reveal that much intimate information mm-hmm. about their shared experience with someone that they love so dearly? And I mean, I can think of a number of reasons on reflection. You know, one, it's cathartic. If if you don't buy into psychology or therapy, and you don't go sit down on a shrink's couch and, and devote, you know, just empty out your brain, then there you have to do that somehow. It p- part of how our our brains operate in my opinion is that we have to be able to articulate what's happening in our life and when it comes to stuff like loss it, it's really hard to articulate it. you can't rationalize it and so talking about it is in, is one way or, or writing it down in this case is one way of working through those very complex and potentially self-destructive emotions that you can go through um, and what's terrible about loss uh, the loss of someone you love is that it the pain never goes away uh, sometimes you will temporarily forget it but then a smell or a sound brings it back a hundred percent and so it's always there with you that experience um, and so I, I would like to think though I, I don't have any inside scoop that this was a way for Magister Barton to work through it but also for the benefit of every Satanist out there because as I mentioned at the beginning of this, we, we do continue to have these same myths and lies perpetuating since Anton LaVey's death. Um, and obviously, it's because you know detractors want to um, diminish his shadow, uh, which persists after death. Um, and with information uh, factually laid out, honestly, uh, forwardly, all of that is killed. Like you, you can't fight truth. It, it's just the reality of it. So, if there's ever any questions that you have, consult this book. If you just want to know about Anton Lavey's life and passing, consult this book. And if you want to support an amazing author, Magister Barton, definitely pick up this book. Um, I, I dug it so much. I was, I was just sitting down on the couch reading it completely sort of entranced with uh, its its blatant realism and uh, I, I remember reading the the book the very first time and I was sort of blown away uh, by the complexity of Anton LaVey's life mm-hmm. and to see some of that echoed in his passing and and how his family reacted and interacted and and what's amazing about this is no matter what difficulties uh, Magister Barton had she doesn't she doesn't talk shit about people, mm. about those that hurt her or attacked her over and over again. Yeah. She leaves emotion at the door, which is amazing. That's, I mean, that would be so difficult. Yes, that is one of the things that I have always appreciated most about her is her. She's very magnanimous, you know, in the face of a lot of uh, uproar and sort of horse shit. <laughs> you know, she <laughs> always had a brave face and she always was was ecumenical and fair and you know she didn't paint anyone in an unfair light and yeah there's a lot to admire about her in this book i'm so glad to hear that there's um more photos because that was probably my favorite part of this book where the very candid and uh, i mean and some not so candid uh photos they're just so yeah. great i love that shit well to be fair there's not a ton more but there is a handful as long as there's one more that's it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah no, it was totally cool. I, I dug it a lot. I, I awesome. highly recommend it for anyone. I mean, you know, a while ago we heard that there was uh, that she was going to be rewriting um, the Church of Satan book, just the Church of Satan. Uh, I had no idea that this was in the works as well, and I'm I'm so so excited now to to find out what is going to make it into the Church of Satan book when it's re released. Yeah. Because okay. I mean, you you can say only so much about an individual, but this organization has flourished mm. past i mean in my humble <laughs> humble opinion uh more than most people ever expected it to and maybe the majority of people um you know when you're not on the inside it's easy to uh be a little cynical or a detractor uh, out of ignorance and i think that's what a lot of people 
are when it comes to the Church of Satan, and uh, we are so much more <laughs> than anyone will ever know. Thank it's you. great. Um, all right, so on that note, let's uh, let's lighten it up a little <laughs> with some Satanism talk because <laughs> we haven't been talking about. Oh, you know, what? before we start, I I, I got to tell you this. This is so fucking weird. Tell me if you've ever heard anything like this before. Um, well, first, before I do that, uh, my garden is going insane. It is, like, so lush and jungle-like, it is a nightmare. Like, every day we have to go out and pick more vegetables, and there's so much that we cannot consume it in enough time. Um, we have tons of cucumbers, an insane amount of snap peas and green beans, and um, uh, a ton. we had four tomato plants, both cherry and traditional Roma, and we are up to our fucking ears in tomatoes. It is insane. We have cantaloupes out the ass. We have pumpkins growing, which I'm super excited for. So it's it's an insane amount of produce. I don't quite know what to do with it. Uh, but because it takes so much time every single day to make sure we harvest all of the good food and we don't leave it for all the bugs and stuff, um, you know, we're, we're out there a bit. And our chickens are just running around, super happy, eating all the little bugs that are attracted to the garden, which is just really great um and they're doing really great uh giving us <laughs> like crazy amounts of eggs which we're also almost drowning in um <laughs> it doesn't sound like a bad problem but y when you have too much shit you don't want to waste it and so you're like okay well who is worthy of me giving this to <laughs> you know <laughs> it's tough so it ends up being like my wife's family <laughs> and i'm just <laughs> like eh, i wish i knew people closer because i would just give away food um so our chickens were in the garden while uh, my wife was harvesting. I was in the kitchen making some uh, onions and brats for lunch. And she's like, I don't know, I was like screaming. And so I run outside and I see the chicken running away from her and my daughter with something in his mouth. And she's like, the chicken just caught a mouse in the garden and she's eating it. A chicken. Like, have you ever heard of that? I didn't think chickens were carnivores. <laughs> I, I had no idea this happened. Like, she, my wife posted on Facebook or something. My mom, who has a bunch of chickens and inspired us to get them, said that that's a normal thing. Like, they will, if they're fast enough, they will catch mice and eat them. That's in, okay. Like, I'm learning something guess, new about chickens every day. Yeah, apparently I'm incredibly ignorant about what goes on in the world of, of chickens. Because I, I thought for sure they were not omnivores or carnivores they're like garbage disposals they'll literally eat anything that it's is wild to me. but he, he is so fucking weird seeing this chicken dragging in its beak it's tiny tiny little beak this fucking mouse and then like it like it was obviously wounded or something it was like fighting with it before it grabbed it and ran away but mm -hmm. it just dropped it on the ground and started tearing it up like it was a vulture or something and i'm just sitting here slack jaw like this is unbelievable i've never this is so new to me. I thought I, I thought I reached my peak of chicken experience with the Lamaze thing. But holy fuck, now they're eating mice? Like, I'm afraid to go out there and not have food, because am I next? You probably are, first of all. <laughs> and second of all, I guess it makes sense. I guess birds are... <laughs> they do eat other animals. It just never occurred to me that a chicken is a bird. <laughs> I forget that they're actually birds because all they do they're like ground birds you know they can't yeah. go anywhere but i guess that makes sense that they would be i mean their beaks are definitely designed to tear shit up right oh yeah i don't know yes all i know is all, my only experience with like live chickens is my dad used to work in a like a on a chicken farm and he told me once that nothing in the world smells worse than chicken shit oh wow has that been your experience no we have such a big backyard it's oh. never com like piled in. and we clean out their their um their coops so we never sure. it's not okay. a problem at all i guess on a chicken farm it get, once you get a lot of birds like that it just does the smell of chicken shit never goes away oh yeah i would imagine i mean most and and to be fair most chicken farms aren't exactly like you know four chickens in a roost, you know, with a whole mm -hmm. backyard to graze in. I mean, it's very sure. much industrialized. So I, I don't imagine there's tons of cleaning involved either. So that would be a horrible, horrible smell. Yeah, every once in a while, we'll get like a little gift on our deck. But other than that, it's like zero problem at all. They're just really great. And even when the little fucking, <laughs> the little bitch Abrielle uh, comes sneaking in our house and like, 
we're cooking or we're having a drink around the table or something and we just see some motion and it's just like kicking it, staring at us. Like, hey guys, how's it going? <laughs> Can I come in? <laughs> like, What do you do with it in that case? Well, I mean, they're really friendly with humans. So, you know, she just wants to hang out. And <laughs> ultimately what we do is just, you know, herd her outside. Like she'll, you know, she'll follow in front of you if you start stepping up behind her. Okay. Um, but, you know, they let you pick them up and pet them and they'll eat out of your hand. I mean, they're super friendly. Have you told it's, your children yet that you're going to someday eat those chickens? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They, oh, okay. But it's going to be like six years. I mean, chickens yeah. traditionally, this has turned into a chicken show. Um, <laughs> they traditionally lay for, you know, six to eight years or four to four to eight years, best case scenario. That's and cool. after that point, then they're just too old and haggard, much like, you know, a menopausal woman. Then we Excuse have to put them down. Excuse me? <laughs> Why did you just call me? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, but, it, you know, the meat's going to be tough. It's not like... It's not going to be like fried chicken meat. You know, it's going to have to be, be like, like stewing. Eating your Nana. No. <laughs> it's just a chicken. Well, it is I mean, weird. Like, like the, as far as age. Oh, yeah. No, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it, it'll have a good, healthy amount of fat, which I love. Mm -hmm. Juicy. We know. We know. Nana fat. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we know. So gross. <laughs> All right. Let's, let's, let's do... Uh, uh, oh, ah, fuck. Before I do this, um, I've been getting a lot of really great intros from all of you listeners. Thank you so much. Continue to send them in, info at 9 com or 801 um, 899 Yeah, so excited about that. I did... Oh, fuck, hold on. Before I do this, I, I did an impulse buy, which is not like me. And I'm... I feel like I got caught up in some shit hype. And I don't know if I'm too happy about it. So I'm going to need your clarity. I can't thought, wait. Aaron. I got an iPhone 6. Ha uh ha. -huh. Like, <laughs> fucking the day it was available. Of course. And that's not what I do. Like, I don't run out with cash waving in the air like, let me take this and give me. I don't do that. Especially when I have a perfectly fine, like, 5S that I use on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. I don't know why, but... I was like drawn into the ad like I was a sucker for the shit I do I was right. just sucked in and <laughs> my you should know better like, you of all people I, I know right like anyone that works in the industry should totally know better but I don't know what the fuck I feel like I'm becoming an automaton like I, I'm just my mind is being melted away by chicken and gardens and I'm just stuck with an iPhone 6 I don't get it I don't know how it happened <laughs> do you ever get caught up in shit like that like new technology um, uh, not really. I mean, sometimes I can get really excited, but I'm, for the most part, poverty stricken, so I don't <laughs> ever, like, expect to get the newest anything. I just got, I had the, I got the, um, iPhone 5S, and I was pretty fucking hyphy about that for a couple months, because I was like, look at me, mom, on top of the world, I got the newest iPhone, it's, you know, <laughs> I'm hot shit, and then, you know, of course... Two months later, the news that the iPhone 6 was coming out, and everyone was like, hey, dum dum, how's your 5S now? And, you know, <laughs> I mean, it's pretty much the story of my life. Like, if I ever do get excited about anything, it's just like, oh, never, no, 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 don't, no, no, never mind. <laughs> but so, I, what about this camp ad campaign suckered you into the iPhone 6 when you have a perfectly good iPhone 5S, I might add? I know, it is weird. Uh, okay, so the selling points that, that made me get all uh, twinkle-toed, and this is going to sound so retarded. I mean, you're already the, halfway retarded. <laughs> I'm going to be a full tard at the end of this. Okay. Um, it, was the, it was the Wi-Fi calling and uh, the NFC payment. Like the near that? field... Like, you can store your credit cards and, like, just walk through a store and just scan the scanner with your phone and with your fingerprint, and it will charge it right to your card that you have on there. And, and like, that was it. <laughs> I was, like, done. Wait, done. I don't understand that, but I guess I'd, I'm not meant to understand things like that. Well, Google has been... like a rich people thing. <laughs> Google has done it for a while. It never really took off. There's been a couple different companies that have tried to get it off the ground and the idea is to stop carrying around a fucking wallet and just to have every single thing right there at your fingertips security has always been kind of an issue um i've i uh apple not itunes or anything but apple has come up with a solution using your actual fingerprint which is 
as safe as you can be with stuff like this. Um, and so I just thought, you know what, that, that would be super fucking cool. Like I would, I hate wearing a wallet. I don't like a big bulky anything in my back pocket. I absolutely detest it. And I don't like carrying around. I like, I never carry cash. It's always card and I hate it. So if I could just eliminate that one thing by using my phone or having to reach for a wallet, that would be awesome. I don't know. Wow. I feel like I was sucked Is that in. the? Yeah, you definitely were. Is that the one with the big screen? No, no, I'm not a, I'm not a woman. I don't. I see. Okay, that's actually uh, kind of what I was gonna go for. Like, I was definitely gonna call you a name if you said you had. <laughs> I mean, it's, it is bigger screen. than the five S, but it's not like the super huge okay. one that's like a yeah. half a okay. tablet or something. I get it, Adam. I get it. It's not that big. I mean, I'm, I'm a fan of big. Don't get me wrong. I, I like big in, in certain places. No, no, I mean, I get it. You're fucking <coughs> better than mine. I, yeah. Oh. I think everybody <laughs> knows that. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I just feel like a total tool, like a hundred percent tool. But it made you happy, didn't it? It didn't. That's the worst part well, at all. Like I don't feel good me. about it. There's something wrong with my brain. I am a full tard because I, I did it and I traded in my 5s and it sort of cuts off half the cost, which was pretty cool. And then yeah. I'm just like, I don't feel good about this. Why the fuck did I do this? Like uh. I, I should feel good. I don't. There wasn't even that moment of. I've got something new. That didn't even exist. I get a new album. Like I ordered the the Psycho Charger record uh -huh. and I was excited about that. Like super like I got I had that like sort of emotional high. I didn't have that buying a stupid phone. Sure. I was just like, "Oh, the next thing. Here we go." Fuck. <laughs> oh, Fuck. yeah, man. It's like a scene from Pink Floyd's The Wall in here. <laughs> I mean, you've seen that, right? Yes, yes. Okay. Yes, I'm just afraid totally. I'm speaking I'm speaking to someone who's never seen that particular show and then I used to watch that all the time. I mean, I used to do <laughs> a lot of drugs as a kid, so I, I would watch that a lot. That you know, and the doors. I, oh, that and what else? The doors. Oh, okay, yeah. All right. <laughs> what else? With the Doey Val Kilmer doors, you mean? Or like yeah. video of Oh no. I, I never really liked the concert footage to be honest. Hmm. All right. I think we're digressing. We are totally digressing. I'm sorry. Let's get back. All right. Uh, Devil's Advocate coming up next. In nominated in Austria's Thomas Luciferi says, In the name of Satan, the ruler of the earth, the king, though I'm an active member, I do not speak for the Church of Satan. Devil's Advocate, everybody. Are we ready <laughs> for this or what? <laughs> yeah! Right? <laughs> Hello. Okay. Come on. <laughs> come on. Come on. Come on. So uh, today we're going to talk about the fourth satanic statement, which, as everybody knows, uh, is Satan represents kindness to those who deserve it instead of love wasted on ingrates. So what's this a reaction to? Oh, boy. What a question that might be. <laughs> I think it's probably just a reaction to... Um, the psychic vampires out there. I know that psychic vampire is mentioned in another statement, but I think part of that is involved here. But the, you know, I think we've all sort of given our time and psychic energy to people who, in the end, we knew maybe at the time even didn't deserve it. And, you know, fuck those people. That's an interesting. I, I did not think you were going to take that side of it. What side? Like when I, well, not side. I mean, just, you know, that. That aspect of it. Mm -hmm. um, when I was when I was reading the Satanic statements, I always saw them as um, a contrast to Christian ideas sure. that played off of each other, um, and ex through that process explained Satanism. Mm -hmm. um, but it sounds like the way you interpreted this, it was solely and isolated within themselves the statements uh, themselves uh, explanation, which I think is interesting. Well, I think it, I bet that has a lot to do with the fact that I didn't grow up with any sort of religion in my life, <laughs> and you did. You know, no, you, you know didn't I mean? have Jesus. <laughs> Don't you think though that, that that sort of shaped your worldview? Like maybe everything that you think about, you think about in um, in within the framework of how it relates to your religion and growing up. I do really like uh, sandals. So. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that you guys believed in sandals. I didn't know you people believed in sandals. 
Oh, uh, yeah. I'm trying no, to No, I mean, that's a really good point. I, yeah. I mean, that's a totally accurate point. I often, I find myself wondering, um, you know, because my kids every once in a while overhear me yelling or talking about this stuff or screaming Hail Satan at the end or, you know, whatever. They see all of the books and artwork in my personal space. Um, and so I... I sometimes wonder, like, from their eyes, what this is like. And it, it cannot be the same as it was when I was a kid because I was raised in a very Christian atmosphere and they have none of that at all. Yeah. No, so, I, I'm sure that the difference is that, um, you know, the difference between our religion and all the other re- major religions uh, is is the idea of dogma. And that's something that Satanism does not incorporate in the least, you know, or sort of anti-dogma. And all the other major religions, I'll include your little wacky tribe thing, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, it's dogmatic. You don't, there's no room for interpretation. There's, there's only one way to do things and everything based, you know, dogma sort of makes, is, is primary in your consideration. I, and I don't mean your at this point, I'm not including right, right, you right. with them. Um, you know, when you, when your religion is, as a dogmatic one, then you are sort of set to, to believe that, that, that everything sort of falls into line into your, um, characterization of the world. Whereas Satanism doesn't have that, you know, there is no dogma. There's no set of rules necessarily. Like there are these statements and there are rules, what we call rules, but, you know, we're smart enough to know what they mean. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and, and to be quite honest, even after the 11 rules of the earth were published and the sins were published, mm-hmm. uh, they were pretty tongue-in-cheek. Mm-hmm. It wasn't, you know, there's no, you're going to go to hell if you do this, because then they would be doing it. <laughs> They're like, yes, right. that's where I want to be. <laughs> <laughs> Let me commit these sins. So I guess for us, it would be like, you're going to be up in heaven if you, yeah, <laughs> if you sure. do these sins. <laughs> So no, yeah, I mean, straight up on its face, it, it it's very much zero uh, fear-based dogma. It's all pragmatic yeah. you know, human behavior. So Satan represents kindness to those who deserve it instead of love wasted on being great. So through the lens of a psychic vampire, I totally get that. Yeah. Um, and we've we've talked about that a lot on this episode, or I'm sorry, on this show. Mm-hmm. Um, what about what about when it comes to to family? Mm-hmm. So these are the people that you were raised around. Mm-hmm. There is obviously, I'm, I, I think it's pretty healthy uh, through the course of living with your family, growing up with them and, and having a relationship uh, as an adult with them. You're going to you know run through those range of human emotions, love, aggression, mm-hmm. animosity, sorrow. Uh, should you just on face value because they're your family, love them? Mm-hmm. No, of course not. <laughs> and it's just not how it works. And I'm fortunate. I'm so fortunate that I don't even know kind of what, what it would mean to not like a family member of yours. <laughs> you know, I, and I, I realize that I'm lucky. So it's hard for me to say for sure what I would do in that situation. But my family is so small and there's so few of us that um, there really, I there was no room for outsiders even. And those, you know, I was close with everyone, and uh, like I said, I grew up in a non-religious family. We didn't argue about any deep ideological ideas. Y- you know, we we sort of I sort of always agreed with what my parents' politics were and stuff like that. And my immediate family, they're just you know, there just weren't that many of us to argue with. But I can see that in larger families, you know, um, my fiance's family, I see a huge huge range of political views and things like that, and. Um, you know, it's it's weird for me to actually see that because <laughs> you know he has aunts and uncles that he just like they're diametrically opposed to to his uh, Josh's ideals. What is the opposite of a Nazi? Again, <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, uh, he's young. He's funny, no? Hey, uh, guess, uh, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's great, and I, th- I think it's important to to keep that in mind because, especially because Satanists are very much minorities in the world at large, even in a family, we are dramatic minorities, and so y- you will run into situations. I have run into situations where um, I I really want to have a good connection with some of the people in my family, but because I am who I am, they will outright refuse it, 
And that's where the fourth satanic statement comes in. Because rather than me wasting my time and energy trying to convince them that what I am is not what they think I am, or that Satanism is not what they think it is, or that they're in some comfortable place with my particular religion, I can say, well, that is their issue. That is not my issue. And if they ever come to me in a position of affection or love, then I will reciprocate. But until that point, I will not fight for the right because they don't deserve it right now. If they end up deserving it, great. But you know, sometimes your parents will never understand why you are the way you are. Uh, sometimes your sisters or brothers will never get it. And the more you fight trying to explain it, trying to rationalize it, trying to justify it, you just sound like a crazy person trying to explain why the sky is purple and chickens eat mice. Like, it doesn't make <laughs> sense. No one understands it. So you have to just swallow whatever it is that you're trying to get out and say, it is not my place to convince others of something. I have to be content with my life and be happy with who I am and if that is not a positive influence in my life, those individuals, then on your own decision, maybe you just cut ties with them until they're ready to hear you out or maybe they're ready just to accept you because you are who you are. Um, unfortunately, that doesn't happen very much. So, I mean, you know, I, I think that is something that should be brought up. I've, I've seen it mentioned in a number of different places online throughout the years and I want to make sure everyone understands that we are not a Christian religion. We don't we don't forgive and and forget. Um, when it comes to vengeance, it doesn't matter whether it's family or not, or friends or not, or loved ones. If they have harmed us, then it is your right as a human being, as a Satanist, to seek whatever just revenge you 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 know see as necessary. Uh, hopefully through an adult lens, and if you're parents or loved ones refuse to accept who you are, then don't waste your goddamn time on them. Like, if, if you want to be with them and, and have them in your life, that's fine. But don't go out of your way because they will never, unless they want to, understand. And most people don't want to. They just don't. Um... So, so what else? Do you, do you see anything else in this fourth satanic statement? No, I just, I just think it's so interesting that you and I see it in such, you know, not different, um, fundamentally different, but sort of the new, you know, the nuances are different for you and I because we had such radically different upbringings. You know, I have such a small family, and they, we were all um, atheists growing up, and all of that, and and you come from a sort of larger family that was religious. So it's it's interesting to see how we can all sort of. I know I sound like a fucking hippie right now but it's fun to see that we can all come from different backgrounds and take what we um take what we can get from from this religion that we've all decided suits us best it is it is great that that idea too because it, it speaks to uh the openness of what satanism is mm -hmm. uh, it, it's not you have to come from this type of a background in order to understand it it's very much these are are natural human behaviors and no matter where you come from because you're a human being you're going to reflect in these ideas and that is so amazing because you don't you literally don't find that anywhere else like everywhere else tries to have you be in some other way than your natural state satanism it's all you baby it, it's how you are I was almost going to do a little Billy D there, but I chose not to. Uh, I th um, I'm, I'm sure I speak for everyone in saying thank you, Adam, for, for re restraining yourself. I don't know why. What? I don't, I don't know why. I, I think maybe she won't mock me this episode. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. And I don't know that. why you no. would ever think that. Would be <laughs> I know. I'm sad. It's because I had a Christian upbringing, I think. <laughs> <laughs> and you had a lot of family members. So how about, and, and I don't want to beat a dead horse, so if oh, you genuinely but, but, don't think so, then let me know. Hmm. Do you think that this plays uh, against any other of the satanic statements? Oh, no, I don't think it ever had. I've never considered that. To be honest with you, but I don't think so. Why do you? I mean, it seems like you must. Well, I, one, one of the reasons why I started sort of diving into these uh -huh. um, is that I genuinely love that all of these statements are 
not only reactionary to existing uh, religious systems, but also definitive thoughts expressing satanic uh, wit and wisdom, and that they play off of each other in such really wonderful ways. Um, and so Satan represents kindness to those who deserve it instead of love wasted on ingrates. Uh, that kicks over to number six, which you've already mentioned about the concern for psychic vampires. Um, it jumps up uh, uh, undefiled wisdom instead of hypocritical self-deceit. Stop yeah, lying to yourself. These people will never come around mm -hmm. to you. Um, that was number three. Uh, number six, responsible to the responsible, the first part of that again. Um, if you're a responsible individual, you're not going to waste your time running in circles uh, for anyone or anything, you're going to find what works and do it. And if it doesn't work, you're going to find a way to uh, get a similar result or another uh, angle to get the same result. Um, oh, and what else? I, I don't know. I mean, it's just sort of off the top of my head here. Yeah. That's that's kind of where I was going. Where, you know, they do play off of each other in really wonderful, uh, accented ways. So when you're thinking of the satanic statements, I don't like to think of them as nine isolated thoughts. I like to see them as um, nine infernal thoughts that build on each other and the world around us. Um, and being able to uh, speak to that idea with you, Aaron, is it's uh, very nice. So thank you. Thank you. You are good at this, Adam. You should have a podcast or something. <laughs> I should start a podcast. You really should. I have some ideas about names. Oh, really? Yeah, if you want to um, brainstorm. Well, I was thinking of um, uh, uh, Devil's Balls or something, or, or maybe the Devil's Sack, or, or just the sack. And then it'll just be like like a hairless nut sack with like an upside down cross on one of the testicles as the logo. Uh, what do you think? What, what if there were nine of them? And instead of nine sacks, we'd call it like nine balls or something like that. <gasps> nine ball. You like That's that? nice. It's almost a pool reference, so you could do something with like a pool cue, or right? a, well, not a cue, but a ball. Yeah. 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 Like, yeah, yeah. 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 Like the cue, like the ball, like the nine ball. I think it's like That's, red and striped and stuff. I think it's a striped ball. It's a good idea. We should We're play some fucking music this. for people just hang up the phone right now. Yeah. <laughs> I have people on the phone right now. <laughs> Everyone's hanging up on their RSS feeds right now. All right, now. people. Uh, <laughs> we're going to move over to a little bit of Agent Provocateur breaking up our banter. I hope you enjoyed the uh, the Satanic Statement segments. Um, they are they are genuinely interesting and worth discussion. So, so discuss amongst yourselves. Agent Provocateur is next. I am not a liberal nor a conservative. I am not a Democrat nor a Republican. I am not a socialist nor a capitalist. I am not an authoritarian and I'm definitely not fighting for your cause. I belong to no party, I support no politicians, I am loyal to no state, and your cause celebra means nothing to me. I am Darren Deicide, Agent Provocateur. Welcome to Agent Provocateur! I am your dashing host, Darren Deicide. Don't forget to link to facebook.com slash Asian Provocateur on 9 cents with the number 9 in the center. It is where I maintain a newswire with all the wonderfully wacky news about the goings-on of the human animal, as well as the often ignored stuff that fellow thought criminals have no compunctions about indulging in. Welcome to the fold, and a big high five for being the skeptical inquirer that you are. If you haven't noticed... I like to keep you on your toes by oscillating between various formats. Sometimes I'm feeling a little snarky and up for a satire. Other times I'm feeling a bit studious and wish to delve into a topic more deeply. Some of it has to do with my mood. Sometimes it has to do with my beer intake. Other times it's a sense of relevancy urged by the state of affairs. But in all the various methods of producing this segment, there is none more tried and true than the good old-fashioned, randomly belligerent tirade of righteous indignation that seems to always hit the spot. So, this week, I'd like to address the ubiquitous mode of communication that has taken over our modern society, the Internet. I've had a homebrew or two, and I'm ready. Buckle in for some artful road rage. I say this because I look at the information superhighway as just that. Except things have changed since the term was coined. 
at what has come about on the internet is a big traffic jam of epic proportions. When the roadways were paved and few owned cars, driving was sleek and efficient. The fastest and shiniest of minds took advantage of it and moved through the lanes with ease, going through the open road space from one productive destination to another. However, much like everything that gets infested by the human pestilence, that has, ch that has changed. Now, everyone has a car, just as everyone has a modem, and the information superhighway is jammed. I was discussing this with someone recently, and I brought up the question, why is it that everyone, even people who I have a deep respect for and I know have steely intellects, resort to full-on throwdowns over the internet? What is it about this medium that brings this out in people? At first, I entertained the idea that Bill Gates was pumping subliminal messages through the interwaves and our computer speakers, much like the, the way militant atheists are purported to be using chemtrails to kill angels in the stratosphere. But once I came back from sci-fi conspiracy land, we came up with another theory. In fact, we came up with a metaphor. The information superhighway is just that, and it's jammed. When you drive a car and someone cuts you off, what do you do? Do you wave them to the side of the road and have a cup of tea with them? Perhaps get an apology for that grave misunderstanding back there? Maybe invite them over for a lunch as an olive branch for that infraction. Let's start a new page, O oh fateful stranger in the passing lane. No, you lay into your horn, punch your fist into the air, and tell that cocksucker where they can shove it. Maybe you'll pull into another lane, lay in the gas pedal, and try to give him a dose of his own medicine. If the driver is female, an Asian, a cripple, an old person, or any other superficial trait you can pinpoint, maybe you'll pull out your mental dictionary of slurs and stereotypes. That's always fun. In any event, the result is not exactly amicable. First, parallel. It's your ass on the line. God damn it, you almost got killed back there. If it weren't for your obviously cat-like reflexes, you could have become a statistic on the 10 o'clock news right before the story about Ling Ling the panda. Well, the same is true on the internet. Except rather than your ass, it's your mind. The abstract of yourself is just as important as your physical self. Integrity, respect, reputation, all these traits constitute your being and affect where you stand in social ladders. And social dynamics are critical to your survival as an individual. When someone cuts you off on the information superhighway, your reaction is the same. Parallel 1 has been identified. But wait a second, Darren. How could some interactions with people you barely know on the internet have so much at stake? After all, it's my personal Facebook page, and it's private, right? No, wrong. Parallel 2, the worst parallel of them all. Being amongst the public. You'd like to think that when you sign into Facebook, Google, and all those other institutions, that they greet you like Walmart with a virtual maitre d' in a blue smock, that you're still in the safety of your office, sitting in your underwear while drinking your morning coffee, but no, you're not. So get your head out of your ass and take a look at the facts. The more information comes out from the Snowden files and WikiLeaks, the more you know that the second you hit that login button, you are in the public forum. I've been posting tons of articles on this subject at the Agent Provocateur Newswire, so steer your jalopy in that direction and you'll see there is no privacy on the internet, just as there is no privacy in your car. So next time you say something on the internet that starts a giant flame war, imagine that time when you slipped your hand up Susie's skirt while parked behind the 7-Eleven and a security guard flashed a flashlight straight into your eyes like a deer in headlights, because that's what just happened. When you're on the information superhighway, you are running the gauntlet with every other anonymous so-and-so out there, and guess what? You don't own those highways either. On to Parallel 3. When you're in a car, there is a barrier of anonymity that exists between you and that prick that needs to get their license revoked. I'm going to guess that 90% of the time, people who cut you off don't intend to create an accident. The other 10% are a real interesting lot. 
But the rest maybe didn't see you. Maybe got blinded by your neon headbeams, tried to dodge a deer in the middle of the road, or mistook that wailing sound on the techno pop track as them getting pulled over. I don't know. The point is, we've all missed someone in our blind spot before. Doesn't necessarily make us mal malicious drivers. Except for that 10% again. Who are high on angel dust behind the wheel of a jack? They're different. But there is no opportunity for civilized conversation when that barrier of anonymity is between two individuals. You can't hear tone of voice, you can't respond to inquiries, you're essentially screaming at yourself. Well, that's basically what is also happening when two people road rage on the information superhighway. People make assumptions about tones. They misinterpret statements. They hear sarcasm where there is none. But whatever the case may be, what they have in common with the guy who got cut off in traffic is that they immediately assume the worst because their self is suddenly being put into a dangerous and public situation. Like I said, nobody is being invited for tea and crumpets after they get their lane cut off. And my oh my, how often do you get cut off? That leads to parallel four. What once was an exclusive place for the tech-savvy and people informed in their niche of specialization has become a ruckus traffic jam of jalopies pushing and prodding to advance along the traffic. When, when America built its superhighway infrastructure, could it be conceived just how exponential population increase was going to be? I see it here in New Jersey every day. Highways are jammed to the hilt. Construction teams are desperately trying to put new lanes on already four-lane highways. Every schmuck with two eyes has a license, and they probably have a schmuck mobile that personifies their mental capacity. Cars with dangling muffler mufflers and trash bag temporary windows go whirling down the highway at 90 miles per hour. And why wouldn't they? The special interests that own our economy wouldn't dare miss an opportunity to make a sale on a gas tank, and they sure as hell aren't going to miss any advertising dollars that a wide internet audience provides either. The information superhighway is jammed, and it's jammed with less than average thinkers who are essentially poor drivers. Everywhere you turn, a fight is breaking out, and it's the virtual equivalent of being at a standstill while cars in every direction honk their horns. Do you wonder when you're in those jams if those people think honking is actually going to make anything move any faster? Well, the same is true of the internet. The only thing that all these loudmouths looking for fights are doing is making your stay on the highway more annoying than it already is. People argue with no conclusion, falling back on all sorts of logical fallacies in the hopes that the muckraking may give the perception of an ideological victory when all they are doing is laying into the horn. And worse of all, it's now just a matter of who has the loudest and most obnoxious horn. You can just be one of those douchebags that drives an empty Hummer just to be the biggest object on the road. Safety first. I've literally heard someone make that argument for getting a large car. If I get a large car, I'll plow through the smaller ones when I get in an accident. <laughs> yes, well, I hope your pointlessly large car breaks apart in a barrel roll before that happens, you fake weekend warrior. But these road bullies exist on the information superhighway. They're assholes with clickbait teams who spam social networks and dupe the hapless. They're advertising companies that shove a commercial in your face that you didn't ask for just because you wanted to see a woman take a fist in the ass while reading a news report. It's a perfectly normal curiosity. But the format of attention getting, pulling you off your beaten path and portaling you into a place that you never intended to be are the spoils that belong to those who can shove their weight around the information superhighway. And now what do we see? Now everyone wants a piece of the action. Even the Islamic State in Iraq is leveraging this style of propaganda recently with their slickly produced sensational beheading videos complete with movie trailer suspense. Everyone wants the biggest and loudest horn that plays the most interesting version of La Cucaracha. Of course, that's inevitable on the information superhighway traffic jam. If you want to get anywhere, you better take your four-wheel drive V8 Hummer limo, limo, sauce it up with as much neon as possible, and start cutting motherfuckers off if you want to get somewhere. So, 
How do you drive? Do you sit in traffic, laying into the horn, tearing your hair out and getting nowhere? Forget it. Pull over and stay home. Go for a walk. Unplug. When you do unplug in, avoid the traffic and drive from point A to point B with purpose. I'm tired of the road rage. Think back to all those times you road raged on the information superhighway. Think about all the mental energy you put in into trying to understand the person behind the other wheel. Think about all the carefully crafted responses that only generated schlock level rebuttals. Now, think about all the things that you'd like to do that you could have done with that time. It's not a comfortable feeling, is it? The key is to not get stuck in the jam. Be one of those smart guys in his fuel-efficient Japanese car that hugs the shoulder of the highway when he sees it coming and pulls straight for the exit. I don't know about you, but I hate traffic. I'll drink three extra cups of coffee before leaving work just to be sure I don't sit in traffic, meanwhile working on my next great novel. That's the point, though. You don't have to play the game. You can write that novel while all the other suckers sit around barking at each other while going nowhere. Hell, I'm even in favor of doing stuff on the side of the road just to have a bit of fun with all the poor saps. Isn't that basically what nine cents is? <laughs> Why not take advantage of the jam and turn a profit? There's no shame in dragging a cooler out with bottled waters and getting some dollars from agitated drivers. It's way more enterprising than the toothless guy with a Dixie cup. The point is, stay diligent, my fellow travelers. The intellectual road trips are long and far-reaching, but they won't be made by sitting stalled in traffic. Thank you, once again, for joining me on this episode of Agent Provocateur. Hey, maybe I'll do something serious about a specific global affair next time, or maybe I'll do some more poop jokes. We'll see. Take care. Ever wonder why genies are trapped in bottles? Because they're a bunch of goddamn drunks! And like all drunks, they'll talk to anyone who will listen until somebody puts a cork back in the bottle. So, want a little drunken genie nonsense? Then grab a bottle of whiskey and rub one out. Or tune into Nine Cents the first week of every month and catch my segment, I Dream of Jesse. Alright, there you will. Sure you won't stay out in this blackout? Sure is dark tonight. Thank you for the ride, sir. I think I'll be fine. See yourself! What are you doing out here? Oh. I'm headed down to the crossroads. <laughs> Wait, miss. You can't be. You're the... You're the devil. devil. But you're... You're beautiful. beautiful. Just sign here. Oh my god. Hey, everybody. This is stupid. Hey! Oh, Jesus, you scared me, guys. All right. <laughs> All right, please. Hey, hey, hey. Hey, girl. Jesus, I ugh. never let me do that again. Okay, so welcome to this week's uh, month's episode of Down to the Crossroads. I'm uh, really glad to be back. It's been a week a, late. It's been a long time. Just saying. Yeah. So okay. the second month in a row. Just is it saying. really? Oh my god! I'm such a shithead. I'm so sorry. It's all right. Life is just too hard lately, man. <laughs> Yeah, it sounds like it. Mm. Your impoverished life with homework. Ugh, so much homework. <laughs> so, speaking of homework, oh my god, this is so great. We've segued beautifully into this week's sound to the crossroads. <laughs> so, uh, this week's theme uh, is colors. 
or as Ice T likes to say, colors. 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 Yeah, boy. Yeah, word. So, um, so I'm taking a graphic design class this semester, and so I've been spending a lot of time in Photoshop and Illustrator. <gasps> yes. This so, excites me. I love. I am having more fun in this goddamn class than any human being should be allowed to have in a class. That really? Counts. Oh my god, I fucking love it. I love. Ah, it. that makes me so happy. <laughs> See, I'm the person that's, I've always considered myself to be the least creative person I've ever met. So, um, but then I started, I, last semester I took a drawing class, and this semester I'm taking this graphic design class, and apparently I'm a little bit more artistic and creative than I ever gave myself credit for. Um, and for that, I, you know, I blame my older brother, because he was, like, uh, unnatural at everything he did. And that so bastard. I was, yeah, I know, right? Fuck that guy. Uh, so I... was bad at you know initial bad at it i was like oh okay for, i guess that's not for me because i would just watch my older brother just pick up the guitar and then be uh jimmy page the next afternoon and i thought that's how it was supposed to work so anywho <laughs> uh, here i go like talking about me too much as usual no but, no 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 <laughs> I'll, so, I'll tell you what yeah one of the things that i'm sorry before before we jump off of the design uh bandwagon is Two of the things that inspired me the most when I was going through school was the idea of colors having emotional resonance in people mm -hmm. um, and using them in your design to uh, in instigate that emotion as, sure. in, in essence. Um, and then also that fonts, mm -hmm. um, fonts have history. Sure. And by respecting that history, uh, the social events that were happening when they were created, what what caused them to be created from existing fonts before that, um, that has influence on your design as well. And it's not a conscious thing, which is so fucking cool. Mm -hmm. It's it's something that's innate within our human basic educated experience. And we will all follow suit with just the slightest tweak of color or actual font usage if you take it into consideration. What you find most of the time is that people don't ever take that into consideration. And they just say, well, what's the most fancy thing I can do? Ooh, Comic Sans, let's use that. <laughs> Whether, you know, let's just put a drop shadow here because it just makes sense. It helps it pop off the page. But it's so much more than just the the placement of image and object. Uh, there, there are so many details that go beyond just font and color, but they're just, it was the awakening of those elements that drove me mad in love with design. You know? Yeah, I've, I, I can't, um, I'm really, really surprised how much I've taken to this sort of thing. Um, like I said, I never consider myself artistic at all, but I found that, um, just through working in Photoshop, like he, I've just I created a book cover, and I I don't think I've ever been more artistically satisfied in my entire life, <laughs> you know. And I was like, oh. I'm thirty <clears throat> something, <laughs> <laughs> twenty something uh. something years old, and um, I feel like I've just finally found my calling in a certain way. But of course, I'm that kind of asshole. Like I'm that sort of dilettante where every six months I'm just like, oh my god, I found my calling. It's you know. World War II history, and then I take a graphic design course, and I'm like, "Oh, this is my calling." I'm, I was, what if I'm 30, <clears throat> and I'm just, you know, I was born to be a graphic designer. I'm sure that's not true. I mean, ten, you know, ten years ago, I decided I wanted to be a um, astrophysicist, and even back then, when I told people that, they were like, "You're actually too old to be an astrophysicist." <laughs> so that was. 10 years ago and I still think I might be like a neuro linguist someday and maybe I'll be a graphic designer someday. I have a lot of, um, a lot of pipe dreams, but wow. anyway, I'm having a fantastic time right now with this and my I, next semester I'm taking another drawing class and then a typography class and I'm going to just become as fucking well-rounded as a marble <laughs> before the end of this. I, I think it's great. I mean, you're you're broadening your horizons you're learning something new and that is what life is all about in my opinion so that's fucking awesome well i'm having a blast and I'm so super proud of you th that has brought us to this week's theme and colors <laughs> colors to which colors <laughs> pretty good uh so 
So the idea was born from the fact that I've been actually coloring some of Josh's comics. And if anyone's... Crayons? Pardon? With crayons? No, in Photoshop. Um, So, you know, if anyone's following along at home, Josh Lotta is is my fiancé and he has that website, Lotta Land, where he's putting out a lot of comics lately. And I've been coloring like the last five comics that came out and this is, you know, kind of hush hush, but not really, but I've been coloring. Hell yeah, not anymore, isn't it? No, it's not at all. All three people listening are going to know. <laughs> They'll be like, whoa, I remember her purple. <laughs> that was oh. a good purple. So yeah, so that's what inspired this. It was a good purple, wasn't it? I love it that purple. Was. So anyway, enough about me. Let's talk about the blues music. So mm. colors is the theme, and I'm going to go ahead and play the first song. And this is, this is Lead Belly, and he's singing about his yellow gal. So it starts with the typical um, Lead Belly 12-string sort of chang, chang, chang. And the, the words aren't that exciting. You know, he's a, no. he was a great singer, but uh, he had quite a limited uh, lyrical palette, <laughs> as it were. Uh, and this song is kind of, clearly based on Walt Disney's uh, Three Little Pigs song. If you remember that cartoon at all, it came out in like the 30s and it yeah. uh, called Who's Afraid of the Big Bad Wolf? So the tune from that is is obviously he's appropriated for this song. And the lyrics are basically about this, you know, light-skinned black girl that uh, he's he's developed a narrative around. But uh, the crazy thing about Lud Belly, and I'm – Sure, I've played him before on the show, though I don't remember exactly what song it might have been. Um, the interesting thing about Lead Pelly is that he was a um, convicted murderer. <laughs> you know, he killed people, and he was in jail when um, when Alan Lomax and John Lomax found him. Uh, he was in jail for murder. But this song and, and a lot of his other songs were actually children's songs, and he used to sing uh, quite a lot of songs for children he put out a couple albums like uh you know lead belly sings for children and uh he's something in the 1940s called play parties and song and dance as sung by lead <laughs> belly but it's just sort of weird to think that like oh this man has killed at least three people <laughs> whether he meant to or not you know um but he's now singing sort of um skip to my Lou and <laughs> pick a veil of cotton for for kids um so I found that very interesting. I mean, Lead Belly is an incredibly interesting person and singer. Besides the fact that he's killed people, you know. <laughs> yeah, I liked his history more than I liked that song. Yeah, it's not a great song, and I apologize. I know you guys come to down to the crossroads to hear good songs, but um, you know, the more I listen to that song, the more I'm just like, my God, I can't ever listen to that song again. But the the you know the reason I played it and the kind of the point is that it's an important song and it's you know almost everything Lead Belly's done has been important because he is Lead Belly you know and he's um, I think for most people the the blues singer that they think of when they think of blues you know they everybody kind of knows Lead Belly because they've sang his songs maybe in music class like um, uh, like I said Skip to My Lou he did that a, ve- a version of that but. Everybody has kind of heard of him, but nobody really, un- you know, everybody likes to kind of forget that he was in jail three different times for killing people. Well, maybe just, they really deserved it. Oh, I'm sure they did in his eyes. You know, it was sort of <laughs> it was sort of the Wild West back then. You know, he was from, I think, Texas is where he, he was doing his thing. And back then in the, I don't know, 30s and 40s, it was... It was kind of a dual society. You know, if someone drew on you, you drew on them. And, who, you know, the fastest draw won. And I think that's... Well, like like Josh draws? No, no, like draw your gun, you know? Surely you've heard this term before. Sure. Are you sure you're not talking about a cartoonist? Mm-hmm. No, uh, that, that'd be really cool if I somehow found a way to weave that into this. But <laughs> <laughs> They just walk up to people and start drawing cartoons on their arms. <laughs> Motherfuck, I'm going to draw on you, bitch! <laughs> Sure, yeah. Colors. <laughs> Colors. <laughs> okay. So. No, I'm sorry. So, that, I mean, that, that song was like a total walk in the park, but yeah. it was it was like a uh, it was like a Disney ride walk in the park. Yeah, sort of like <laughs> Mr. Toad's Wild Ride, but... Yeah, not a fan. It's not a good song, like I said, but I do think it was important to talk about 
I mean, it's important to talk about Lead Belly because he was such Lead an Belly, influence. Yes. yes. But, and the fact that this is sort of like one of those sing song, kind of a children's tune, but it is talking about, you know, a woman and how his father got in trouble because he fell in love with this yellow gal. And, you know, even the te- the term yellow gal is sort of inflammatory. Like nobody talks like that. If you, I mean, if as, especially as a white person, <laughs> if I were to say like, oh, look at the high yellow over there, like... It's definitely a racist term. And that's what I kind of, you know, that's why I, I play these songs for you guys because. She's a racist. Because I'm a racist. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you and good night. <laughs> I'm going to go. Mike. Commit professional. <laughs> no. No, because I think, that, you know, it's, it's interesting as an artifact. You know, I don't think we can talk about these things like we, you know, as, you know, as much as we should. Listen to me. I well, sound like such an apologist. But, you know, well, the, the thing is, is like, mm-hmm. we look at this music and nowadays we're like, oh, that's Yellow Gal. Give me a break. It's all, you know, who's afraid of the big bad wolf over and over again, but with right. Yellow Gal. Uh, I'm sorry, Yellow, 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 Yellow Gal. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's easy to sort of uh, discount it as, as being good or something. But what we have to remember is that in <laughs> this was a lot of the music back in the day. It, yeah. There wasn't a lot of complexity involved. It was, you are my sunshine, my only, you know, I mean, there weren't like complex themes being shown in in different lights. Mm -hmm. There there was none of that. It was all just right on the face. You want to be able to tap your foot and maybe do a little jig to whatever you're hearing. It was not, if you wanted complexity, you went to classical music. (laughs) You did not go to stuff like this. And so, you know, in that, in that spirit, I, you know, it's great because it, it informs who he was and the time that he came up in. So, so for that, thank you for that. Yes, you're welcome. Let's never play that again. I just, you know, and part of the reason I wanted to play that song was because of the sort of dichotomy between this folk singer and, you know, he was sort of adopted by the left and loved, beloved, um, you know, as a sort of, you know, and the left is very liberal, but of course this man had murdered people. And, you know, it's, he, he, it wasn't forgotten in his time when he was out there recording, people were saying things like that. Like Time Magazine called him the murderous minstrel and like the uh, New York Herald Tribune called him the sweet singer of the swamplands here to do a few tunes between homicides. You know, it, <laughs> That's great. Isn't that great? And it's sort of analogous to what we're do- what we're seeing with. I mean, I hate to be topical because I feel like I'm pandering, but you know, with like Chris Brown and the fact that he he beats women. You know, Ray Rice, the football player, he beats wi- they beat women, but. We sort of excuse it because they're fucking good at Wait what a they second, do. that's a bad thing? <laughs> In some circles, apparently. Oh, okay. I've heard Sorry. it is. But, you know, <laughs> we forgive them. It's the, it's the Chris Brown defense. Like, yeah, but he can fucking dance, man. It's like Michael Jackson. You know, we forgive them a lot of things. And certainly Lead Belly is one of those examples. He was let out of prison early because he was just that good a fucking guitar player. And I find that shit fucking mesmerizing. It is amazing. Mm. What do we have next? Okay. I know. I'm talking a lot. So the next one is, is I'm going to go ahead and hit play on Washboard Sam. And this is called Good Old Cabbage Greens. And uh, so Washboard Sam was born as plain old Robert Brown in Arkansas in, in the 19, 1910, I guess. The song is fun, man. I, I just love it. I did not expect to hear this from you. Right? I know. I love to surprise you. That's part of my plan every every month. So basically, Washboard Sam, he was actually a um, uh, half-brother, I think, to uh, Big Bill Brunzi, who I've played on this show before. He's one of my favorite blues uh, singers and, and guitar players. And he, this is probably Big Bill Brunzi uh, playing guitar on this track as well. He um, They hooked up for a while. They were both born in... Uh, Arkansas, like I said, and they eventually moved to Chicago and started getting into that Chicago sound. They sort of helped develop the Chicago sound. But this, I mean, this is a washboard, washboard Sam, I and mean, he's known for sort of his washboard blues songs. But this song is kind of different from that, and that it's sort of um, where uh, washboard band, jazz, R and B, and uh, blues all sort of congregate and this is what you get i mean this is all of those things this is washboard music this is jazz for sure this is r&b absolutely and it's blues you know it's all of those things 
I don't think you see that mix a lot. No, you don't. This is incredibly rare. This is a, a seminal song. You know, this is this deserves to be in the pantheon of, you know, songs that were you could see almost every style of music represented in this one song and you see it as a sort of nexus for everything that came after it, you know. You can see where jazz uh sprung off of this and where R&B came off of this and you can hear where blues moved beyond this, you know. That clarinet Maybe yeah. is that clarinet that we're hearing right? I mean, it's that's jazz, you know, that's Benny Goodman shit right there. But this is yeah, Washboard yeah. Sam was a blues musician, you know, and that's fucking that's the that's the shit I live for, you know. <laughs> this is this is the epitome of what what it all is about for me, you know. This is the ex- exemplar of that. It's everything at once, you know. This is one of those songs where if you were doing a fish fry and this came on, uh-huh. everyone would stop what they were doing and, and they would dance. just start dancing. Fuck yeah, man. <laughs> it's, it's a good song. This is awesome. I thought you might like this one, but I know you'll like the last one I play. <laughs> mm, I know the last one. Oh, do you? Well, good. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, this is one of those songs that, you know, maybe it's not the greatest song you've ever heard in your whole life, but it is... Like I said, an exemplar of what was to come, and you know, it's one of those things. This is what music is all about. Like the the the, the this is sort of part of the catalyst that created all sorts of other genres of R and B and jazz and blues and all that shit. It's also nice to know that there's <clears throat> there's music that doesn't have to make a statement. There's music that can be enjoyed on the nose just for the fun of listening to it just for the fun that inspires you to move no matter what and and that was one of those tracks where you cannot sit still like something your leg will be twitching your foot will be tapping your hands will be moving something is going to be twitching maybe your taint is twitching i don't know oh god mine was it was i mean embarrassing but can you just like for what for like just my segment maybe not could you just refrain from using the word taint just Maybe while my show was on, I mean. Well, first of all, it's <laughs> freshly shaven. Yeah. Um, have you ever it's cut nice. your, Have you ever it's, cut your butthole shaving? No. <laughs> Add that to your bucket list. <laughs> <laughs> I should try it. <laughs> I mean, it's it's bound to happen if you're anywhere near the region. One of these days, you're gonna mark my words. You're gonna nick your butthole. <laughs> 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 I'm looking forward to the butthole nicking day. <laughs> it's a rite of passage, I assure you. You'll feel like a entirely you'll oh, feel reborn. Funny. Oh, how the fuck do we get to nicking butthole? That's awesome. <laughs> I blame you. All right. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, I mean, nicking butthole, red, little red rooster, uh, colors. Uh, all right, there it is. Play, push play, everyone, and just try to forget what Adam was just saying. <laughs> So, this is Big Mama Thornton, and this is Little Red Rooster, and this is the uh, coup de gras of this month's Down to the Crossroad Colors segment. I this love is this so much. This is what we've all been waiting for. <laughs> I knew this. I knew Adam would like this. And God damn, I love this woman. Ugh. I try at least once a month to appease you because you're like a hungry, hungry hippo of music. And you deserve this. This one's for you. It's been a long time coming. <laughs> so this is Big Mama Thornton, and this is Little Red Rooster. And everyone knows this song because Willie Dixon wrote it, and uh, Howlin' Wolf has done it, and Charlie Patton, one of his songs inspired it, and Memphis Minnie had a song that inspired it. It's a, it's one of those prototypical blues songs that is an amalgamation of every other blues song that the guy who wrote it ever heard you know any song he ever heard about a rooster he took a line from that he took a line from another song he heard about a rooster and and turned it into this gem you know willie dixon's written a lot of songs i've played on this uh segment before Mm -hmm. like spoonful he did spoonful for Colin wolf and i'm sure there were others but so his was the original it was called red rooster little red rooster and it had like i said influences from charlie Patton and from memphis mini but this is Big Mama Thornton, and she has managed to make this song all her own. And if anyone maybe recognizes her name before, it's because she did the original of Hound Dog that Elvis Presley did. 
Yeah. And uh, you can hear a little bit of Janis Joplin and Big Brother and the Holding Company in this song. And that's because um, maybe ev- Janis Joplin did a song called Ball and Chain that uh, Big Mama Thornton originated. So she didn't necessarily write. She definitely didn't write this song. She didn't write Hound Dog. And I don't she might not have written Ball and Chain, but she definitely was the first person to do them and to, she definitely made them her own, especially with this song, Little Red Rooster, where you can hear her doing sort of um, impersonations of chickens. And yeah. that's another reason this one's for you. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, and she's doing the howling of the rooster and she's she's doing all the great sound effects that became you know, part of the um, repertoire. If anyone was doing this song, they sort of incorporated that um, animal sounds into it, but Big Mama Thornton was such a um, unique character in the world of blues. Like she was, um, purportedly, she was an open, openly lesbian woman, and that was kind of rare in the fifties uh, and forties. And uh, she was born in the, I guess, the early twenties or late twenties, and she died in the eighties. So she lived a uh, kind of a long time, but um, yeah, I guess she was kind of gay and <laughs> I, don't, I don't know because wikipedia doesn't mention it but i've heard i know that i've read other places that she was an openly lesbian woman and i i have no re- reason to believe that's not the case i am i can easily see her lapping a lot of push um, damn um uh, <laughs> you know, where is this coming from wow i don't know i don't know where that i apologize but uh so you know big mama thornton she did the chitlin circuit which i think is the greatest name for anything ever and it's <laughs> you know it was like a string of clubs in the eastern southern united states where you know mostly african-americans played mostly for other african-americans and it's sort of you know from harlem to juke joints in mississippi that was the chitlin circuit so that's big mama thornton you know everybody like i said she did the song hound dog that Elvis Presley made famous and you ain't nothing but a hound dog. That's the one barking at my door. Yeah, no, she was, she did an amazing job at that. Yeah, she did. I, I love this. It, it reminds like, I can see where like screaming Jay Hawkins gets his inspiration from her mm-hmm. in, in his work too. Cause he does a lot of the same kind of stuff, but I love, I, I love her because she has, um, what is sort of stereotypical for the big black gospel women. And that's this bold, powerful voice. Mm-hmm that just comes out of nowhere um you just don't really expect it for for some reason and um and you talking about her being a fucking pink triangle is a little upsetting (laughs) because i've always kind of had a thing for her well she's dead so (sighs) that doesn't matter in my imagination kind of trumps everything you know I mean, if you can get over the fact that she's dead, maybe hopefully you can get over the fact that she's also a lesbian. (laughs) But she is dead, first and foremost. (laughs) I guess that may have something to do with me not being able to live out my fantasy. Well, that was great. Thank you for that. I I think that was a crazy strong finish to uh, a very bad beginning. Hey, come on. (laughs) It was a vehicle for my... You know, uh, yeah, no, I get it. I get it. Colors yellow, green, red. I get it. But it was a chance for me to talk about Lead Belly and how he killed people <laughs> and shit. He just murdered people left and right. He did. And then sing a countdown. <laughs> countdown, ladies, sing the song. <laughs> da, da, da. No, That's that wasn't exactly him, right. everybody. But yeah. He did that when he was murdering people, though. <laughs> Black crack it, can't down raise it. <laughs> All right, well, that is wonderful. Where can people find a little bit more about Big Mama Thornton munching carpets online? Oh, on down to the crossroads, I talk about that daily. <laughs> yeah, um, it is a trending topic. They would say nowadays. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, uh, Facebook at you know I'm on at there at down the crossroads, and on Twitter I'm at Chelsea Girl nineteen. Yeah, I definitely recommend checking out down to the crossroads online um it it, always there's always something uh either music or imagery or articles or something that will broaden your horizon uh when it comes to the blues the real devil's music in my opinion so thank you aaron for doing that very much my pleasure all right well everyone that is going to do it for another show 
We hope you uh, remotely enjoyed it. I can't believe it's over already. Mildly enjoyed it. Yeah, we haven't actually, because you've been kicking me off to the curb, we Let's haven't talk done any. about things. <laughs> like we need news. to talk, Adam. <laughs> I know. It's not my I'm, fault. I no. I, here's here's what's happening. Is your this is what happens when people are are kind of tired of doing what they do, they push <laughs> it off, and so that I'm just waiting for you case. to be like, that you're gonna be like, I don't want to do this anymore. Look, that I is, haven't wanted to do this for a long time. Hey. You come home from work, you're oh. tired, you don't look at me anymore. <laughs> We're gonna have to stop, you're and I'm gonna cry for about a year. Projecting. It's gonna take me a lot to, a lot to get over. You're definitely projecting right now. <laughs> <laughs> I want everybody to know how much I enjoy doing Down to the Crossroads. I don't care how much you fucking ingrates. Don't care about listening to it. This is, the, this is the part of the show where Aaron's drunk and she tells it like it really is. I don't care what any of you do. I'm going to live my life because I'm a full-grown adult and I... <laughs> I'm drunk and I am not afraid to tell it like it is. I'm gonna kill afraid. someone and I'm gonna play blue, blue in the in the jail and then liberals are gonna get me out. They're gonna get me out. Cause I am a strong <laughs> black woman and I don't gotta give a shit what none of y'all think. So I can munch carbon if I want. Don't judge. <laughs> so that concludes the racist section of the drunken rant. I just I miss you. I don't know why it's feels like every it's so many months between conversations and then the episode goes by like that and yeah nobody cares what we do and <sighs> i feel you <laughs> i feel you I, i'll tell you what i think the reason why uh the audience likes the episodes that you're on is because they get a sense of the rhythm that we have <laughs> you know the the back and forth the natural reflection of opinions and and uh, personalities, and I think that's a good thing. I think that's a really good thing. Um, it comes through really well. I have I have yet to have someone on the show who is a regular contributor that I can't speak to, but I don't know that I have anyone on the show that I have a rhythm with, hmm. like I do with you. And and I I really respect that. I like that a lot. So I'm really happy that you come on and continue to do it. Nobody cares, Adam. I do. Nobody listens. I do. <laughs> I love it. I cherish these times. <laughs> well, we would also love to hear from you, the audience. Visit the website. See how smooth that was? Ninecentspodcast.com and send your correspondence to info at ninecentspodcast.com. Let us know of any suggestions, critiques, corrections, general comments you might have. Also, let us know if you liked that yellow song. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody likes that song. Again. You can visit the Satan at Facebook, Google Plus, Twitter, or MySpace page for Nine Cents and let us know if you hated the yellow song as much as I did and get updated on weekly <laughs> <laughs> I do love Big Mama Thornton though. Like, how can you not love that well, woman? That was for you. That was all she was, Adam. She's so fucking amazing. Um, okay, download the show Mondays via the RSS feed found at 9centspodcast.com. We're also on Last FM, Stitcher, and YouTube. Look for us there. You can subscribe to 9 Cents via iTunes by searching 9 Cents. And if you do go that route, leave me a rating or comment. Leave me a rating and comment. Would it kill Hell, just you? Just leave me a comment. Would it kill it, you to leave a I rating? I got a couple. And I, I post them up on my testimonials and stuff. So I, I do appreciate those of you who are interacting with us in some way. We are always open to it. Would it if kill you'd like you? to learn more. What? Would it kill you? I don't know. <laughs> Is fucking lead belly just, involved? I'm just getting drunker and more belligerent. Would it, would it kill <laughs> you guys? <laughs> Uh, if you'd like to learn more about the Church of Satan, visit churchofsatan.com. And remember, the only way that we're going to continue doing this drunken, ranting, screaming in your ear podcast is if you in you. some way share it share it with someone or no one but just share it share it with your parents who hate you, <laughs> they hate you. your parents don't hate you guys they fucking love you like well, i that, promise you that girl in the corner right there do you see her I swear they to hate you. her Swear to her God, parents they love you hate so much, her. you guys. They love you so much, they don't even know Shut how to up. express it. <laughs> Once again, yeah, they love you as much as Jesus loves you. Ooh. How much is that? He's dead too. If Big Mama Thornton can't please me, Jesus can't please you. Man, Damn it. Adam is is mad. He is <laughs> resentful and he is drunk. I've only had one glass of wine, so I'm not quite drunk. <laughs> Give me a little time. Once again, thank you for joining me. And as always, I'm your host, Adam Campbell, being joined by the lovely... Aaron. 
the lovely Aaron. Aaron. Thank you so much for doing this. I'll say. And until. What? <laughs> oh wait. No. What were we gonna? Wait. Would you? Until next week. I'll say. Hey, I'll say. Hey. <laughs> was at the same time. That was good stuff. Yeah, yeah. All right. So this is who's doing the show, the Halloween show.